right. Wow. Well, uh, I, I kind of feel like going back to my seat just so we can do that again. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, I love you guys. I always enjoy coming here and, uh, and being able to share the word here. I appreciate uh, God so much for just connecting me and Pastor Brandon and Mark and other members of the staff and uh, uh, just work that we've done together to just advance the kingdom. And it's just been a joy. And certainly um, uh, for any person who is a preacher or a public speaker, it's always fun um, when you're talking to people who, um, who you're on the same page with. I mean, we, we love Jesus. We love God. And, uh, and just want to really see everything he wants to do in us, done. And everything he wants to do through us, done. And so certainly as you're hearing Pastor Brandon talk about uh, some of the things that happened in the city of Roseville uh, uh, years ago and what he's doing now, I hope you see him positioning some stuff. I hope you see him positioning some stuff. And interestingly enough, I wouldn't think about that when uh, I felt like God wanted me to share this particular message, but, but certainly this message even today is about the positioning of God and what he does when we follow through uh, with, his, with his leading. Um, if, you, if you pass the microphone around uh, most congregations and say, how many of you want to do God's will for your life. People would be like, yeah, I, I absolutely want to do that. I've read Purpose Driven Life five times, and so I've, you know, I've, you know, and so people want to do that. They want to, they want to be a part of the will of God. They want to be part of the move of God. But what oftentimes is lacking is the discipline to obey the voice of God. And the voice of God is, is a necessary ingredient in the will of God. You won't accomplish one without the other. And so speaking of hearing the voice of God, I, I think he's telling me, don't forget to introduce your wife for those who have not met her. <laughs> She's in the back, babe. Go ahead and wave your hand there, Janine. My wife and our, and our good traveling buddy uh, and, 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 uh, and babysitter. Uh, <laughs> Tyron is with her as well. <laughs> So one of our one of our personal wins today was getting both the kids checked in today with no issues, and so yes, four year old and one year old, and so yeah, um, so 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 hearing the voice of God is important, and but it takes time to tune in with Him, to learn how to tune in. It, it take it takes time, and um, one of the things that's so important for us. Uh, as, as believers, is to kind of confront the, the human nature side of us that wants to put the way God moves in a formula so we can be predictable. And so sometimes when you talk to people about hearing God, they say, oh, God always speaks to me in dreams. Or someone say, God, God always speaks to me in threes. Anytime you send me a message, he sends it to me three times, and I know that's, that's God. Um, well, here's the reality. No, he doesn't always speak to you in dreams. No, he doesn't always speak to you in threes. No, he doesn't always speak to you one kind of way, whatever that way you think it is. He doesn't. We, we want to feel that way because it kind of gives us some, not, not necessarily control, but again, predictability. Like, like we, we've got him figured out. And then if you think he speaks to you in dreams all the time, then you're going to miss it when he, when he writes a letter and sends it to your house. Well, it's got my name on it. Uh, it actually says it's from God. Can't be him. It's not a dream. <laughs> you know, you, you can't lock him in that way. And so, so sometimes people say that as if it's like spiritually mature to say, oh, he, he always speaks to me in dreams. No, it's actually immature because that means you're missing out all the other ways he speaks to you. So, so spiritual maturity is about, is about, like Hebrews tells us, to, to have our senses where we can discern right from wrong, but also be able to pick up on God's voice, be able to pick up his messages however he sends them. So you want your spiritual radar to be so sensitive that if he speaks to you in a dream, I got it. If he speaks to you in a billboard, I got it. If it's a bumper sticker, I got it. If it's a stranger walking across the street with a hat on and something on his hat, I got it. Right? That, that's God. You want to be able to be so sensitive to him that however he wants to speak to you, you can pick it up. 
you can pick it up. Because he's going to lead you by those, by how he speaks. His voice will come before his will. Because he'll tell you to do something to position you for his will. And sometimes you didn't even recognize that until cause you, you thought you were brilliant and that this idea was yours until you, you, just, you just did some idea, right? You just did something you thought was normal, and then super, something supernatural happened. You go, oh, that was God. Like, that idea came from God. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it wasn't yours. But it flowed so naturally to you that you thought it was your own. You got to start thinking how inter- intertwined your spirit is with his. It's supposed to be natural because you're his child and he's your father. So, so God positions us in different ways. And, and there's a, the passage of scripture uh, I want to share with you today from John chapter 4. It's a story about the woman at the well. And, um, and so I, I, I told the earlier service, and I'll try and make it a goal here as well to kind of finish before 3. So... Um, <laughs> No, I know we got, we got fun day out there in tri-tip, and I, I personally do not leave tri-tip waiting. So, so we'll, we'll see how much we can, we can get through today. But I want us to, to dive into this. And as we look at this story, this story is, is, is a story that pr- probably some of you have already read before. And this is a story that some of you probably have never even heard before. So we're going to read a large portion of it and then pull out some things that I believe are relevant for what God wants to show us today. So in, in the beginning of, of, of John chapter 4, Jesus has... He, the, the Pharisees are, are, again, trying to trip him up. They're trying to hate on him. They're like, oh, man, we don't like Jesus. And so Jesus is actually moving. He's leaving, he's leaving a place called Judea. He's going all the way back north up to a place called Galilee. And doing that, verse 4 says, and he had to pass through Samaria. Okay? This, this right here is a key verse. The, the majority of the rest of chapter 4 is about 45 to 50 verses of Jesus having a conversation with, with, with a woman and what ends up happening as a response to that. So there's this whole story that we know of, that the, the longest recorded conversation we see um, Jesus with anybody in the Gospels, it's this conversation. But this conversation, this encounter that ends up happening does not happen without verse 4. He had to go through Samaria. He had to pass through Samaria. So let me, let me show you what I'm talking about with, it, with this map. So, so the, the dotted line here on the, on the, on the uh, this, this here, I forget the, the, the projections from the back so it, it makes the thing. So this dotted line here, this is where all the Jews, since 722 B.C., all the Jews, when they were leaving here, going up to Galilee, they would cross the Jordan River here, where this dotted line is. They would go up the side of Samaria and then cross the Jordan again to get into Galilee because they hated the Samaritans because the Samaritans were half Jewish and half other races of people. Centuries before, they intermingled and in interracial relationships, and so the Jewish perspective was that they were a mixed breed. They were less than. We hate them. They hate us. We have nothing to do with them. They have nothing to do with us. As a matter of fact, we will cross the Jordan River here to go all the way around their country. We don't even want to walk through the country. But on this day, Verse 4 says, Jesus had to pass through Samaria. And this wasn't about geography. Because every other time Jesus went from here to here, he followed the traditional Jewish route. But today, today, he had to pass through Samaria. And Samaria is a region as kind of like uh, we, we will call like a county, and Sychar is a city in the region of Samaria. So when you see the word Samaritans, it's not about one city; it's about a whole region of people. Okay, there are multiple villages and cities in there. So Samaria is a whole region of people. So, so it says now. I'm, I'm going to come back to verse four. That's why I'm kind of emphasizing that strongly right now, okay? So verse 5, so he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, so Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, because they were walking, right? 
He was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour or noon. So the sun is directly above you. Very, the hottest time of the day. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. Now, because of all the cultural things I just told you, that's what leads a Samaritan woman to, to have some objections. She says, it says, for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. So John's clear to put that in parentheses there for all the readers who might not know, like us today, that, that there's, there's a history here on why this lady is asking this question. She's basically saying, Jesus, you're out of line. This conversation shouldn't even be happening. And last I checked, we're in Samaria. Why are you here? Everybody knows you all crossed the Jordan. <laughs> Go up north and cross the Jordan. You don't even want to be here. So how is it that you are here? So, so, so what we end up seeing is how Jesus crossed barriers to reach one person. There's a huge God encounter happening here, but you got to see what sets that up. And anytime you or I decide that we're not going to cross certain barriers, we will eliminate ourselves from being a part of the God encounters he wants to use us through to, to, to have with other people's lives. Sometimes following the voice of God to be a part of the will of God calls us to places, unlikely places, where we can meet unlikely people. Here Jesus today says, we got to go through Samaria. I got to go through Samaria. I need to go through Samaria. And it wasn't about geography. It was about purpose. So Jesus is a man. She's a woman. That's a violation because they didn't talk to other men in public unless it was somebody biologically related to them. So, that they're, they're, so Jesus crossing a gender, a gender issue there. And then she's a Samaritan. He's a Jew. She, he's crossing a racial barrier. And she's like, wait a minute. Something is wrong here. But Jesus does not even respond to that. Instead, he says this. If you knew the gift of God and who it is that's saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He's, he's saying, she's saying, that this is, you know, Jacob is our, our ancestor who bought this land dug this well, and you're saying you have better water than what's in Jacob's well? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us this well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. And Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water in the natural will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water I will give him, spiritual, will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up into everlasting life or eternal life. So, so she's thinking in the natural. Jesus is transitioning her to think in the spiritual. But what I want you to see as we go through this particular story is how Jesus is leading her into a discovery of who he is. He's not coming out outright and just telling her who he is. If he tells her who he is, that's information. If she discovers it, it's revelation and it's transformative. And sometimes when we're talking to people, we're trying to give them information. If you get into an argument or a debate with people, it's because they're not ready. Right? Stop it. The longer you go, whatever you experience then, that's your fault. Right? G we don't... He never debated with anybody. He didn't argue with anybody. And so even with her objections, he says, I got water today. If you drink my water, you won't thirst again. She's like, okay, not only are you Jewish and in Samaria, but you are weird. <laughs> You're weird. But she's curious. She's curious. We're going to find out why in a few minutes. She's curious. So, so he's, he's kind of baiting her. He's drawing her in. He's drawing her in. I've got water. It's different than this water. I've got water. It's better than this water. I got water. Lasts longer than this water. She's like, well, then give me, give me the water then. What are you, what are you, <laughs> you see me out here? It's hot. I got a, I got a water pot on my head. It's heavy. I mean, give me the water then. 
So, so she goes, watch, watch the shift. The shift goes from him asking for water from her to offering water to her. And she says, sir, give me this water so I will not be thirsty anymore or have to come out here to draw water. And Jesus says, go call your husband and come here. This is where, if we were watching a movie, the music would change. Doom, doom, doom. Because her countenance would change. See, now you're bringing up my past. My story. Go call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, you are right in saying I have no husband, for you've had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. And the woman said to him, sir, I perceive you're a prophet. Oftentimes, this woman is considered promiscuous, a prostitute, all kind of other names, um, but there's nothing in the text that says that. And sometimes it comes from the phrase, well, the man you're with now is not your husband. You've had five husbands, and the one you're with now is not your husband. Well, well here, here's the deal. Uh, she had five husbands. Those were legal marriages. And just for the sake of time, I'll kind of summarize this. In, 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 the, in the book of Ruth, you remember there's a story of Boaz who, who wants to marry Ruth. Ruth's husband died, so she is a widow. Boaz wants to marry Ruth, but the rules were that the person who is most, the, the man most closest of kin to her has the first rights or responsibilities to marry her if he wants to. So Boaz has to check with that guy and see if he wants Ruth. When that guy says, no, I don't want Ruth, Boaz is like, sweet. So then Boaz, Boaz marries Ruth, right? He's, he, he's, he's, it's the kinsman dynamic. In the New Testament, in the New Testament, there, there are two gospels, Matthew and Luke, where, where the Sadducees are trying to trip up Jesus. And so the scenario that they bring up is this. Hey, Jesus, um, if a woman... Uh, who's married, doesn't have any children, if her husband dies, and then her brother marries her, because that's what they do. Her brother marries her so he can have children in, in, the, in the brother's stead, right? Uh, but then he dies, and then the, the third brother marries her, and then the fourth brother marries her, and all to the seventh brother. When she dies and goes to heaven, whose wife is she? He's like, y'all are tripping. Like that's what <laughs> God sent me to save y'all. I mean, y'all. <laughs> so, so here's why they asked that question, because that was a cultural norm. If something was happening to me in that in that time period, my brother would keep her in the family and marry her to bring in the family. During a betrothal, it, the the engagement was like one year. Like Joseph and Mary, it was like one year. But with her, and, and after that one year, that's when you go get her, marry her, and now you're officially, you know, she, she moves in. But in a remarriage, when the guy is already married to somebody, and he's just bringing this other woman to bring her into the home, she can move in first for that entire year until they actually get married. The one you're with now is not your husband. How would she have five, five husbands? It's unlikely that it was about divorces because in that culture, if, if the man divorced you, which he could do for pretty much any reason, if he divorced you, no one else is going to want to marry you. So it's for, it's for sure it didn't happen to her five times. These husbands died. She's not promiscuous. She's a grieving widow times five. Nothing good ever happens to me. I come out here at noon because the other married women who come out in the morning when it's cool, they don't want me around. So I come out by myself. I didn't even have a friend to say, girl, I'll go out there with you. I'm out here by myself. 
high noon, the hottest time of the day. No one wants to come out here and get water at this time of day, but I do because that's the only time I can come out here. I, I've been rejected. I've been abandoned. I've been grieving. I've experienced loss. I've experienced pain. I've experienced all these kinds of, and, and then internally unworthiness. But I'm interested to hear what else she had to say. Because he kind of gives her an out. Go get your husband. And I, if she really wanted to leave, that's the time you'd leave. Right? Sometimes you're talking to someone you don't want to talk to. You want, you want somebody to call you, right? I got, I, I got the phone call. My bad. I got to go. Right? You, you, you want someone to get you out of a scenario that you're uncomfortable with or you want to leave, but you don't know how to leave. Right? Jesus kind of gives her an out if she wants an out. She, she answers the question instead of saying, oh, you go get my husband. Okay, yeah, because I'm out because you, you are tripping. I don't know this Jewish guy. There's weird Jewish guy in Samaria. Like she, no, she stays. Why does she stay? Because she's hungry and she's hurting. And oftentimes hungry, uh, hurting creates hungry. And God sees her, and he names her issue. And now he can name her issue. And what he does not do, what he doesn't do is judge her. What he doesn't do is have pity on her. What he does do is love her. And so when he, when he brings up her past, she, she, she doesn't feel exposed as if the bringing up of her past is attached to her shame. Instead, she feels known because the bringing up of her past is attached to his love. That's what changes her. So then the conversation begins to shift. She says, I, I perceive you're a prophet, right? That's what words of knowledge do. In that moment, we go, okay, this is not a natural conversation anymore. God's here. Right? You hear from God. You're a prophet. And so Jesus is like, you're getting warmer. You're, you're getting warmer. So then she goes, our fathers worshiped on this mountain because she's a Samaritan. Right? You know, there's a similar Jewish uh, lineage, but they kind of branched off. Our fathers worship on this mountain over here in Samaria, but you say as a Jew that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to go worship. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain or in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You, will, you worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is a spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. So this is a revelation about what is going to come. Jesus just gave her a heads up on how things are going to shift. She's used to going to a place for worship. The Jews are used to going to a place for worship. And Jesus is saying, the time is coming, and because I'm here bringing it now, the time is now here where it won't be a place. God's going to worship from your spirit. You will be the house of worship. He will dwell inside of you, and you won't be concerned about whether going over here or going over there. But here's what's interesting about this conversation, because this woman, this woman, well, all her past and all her pain, you know, when you talk to a, a, a prophet, you have an opportunity to ask somebody a question who you know might have the answer, you're going to ask them the question that's been burning in your heart. But what she doesn't say is, is this you're a man of God, a prophet of God, what does God think about me? What does he think about what I've been through? Well, has he forgiven me of my past? Am I valuable to him? She doesn't ask anything like that. What does she, in the midst of her drama that she's been through, here in the hot sun at high noon, by herself, getting water from this well, the burning question on her heart is, am I worshiping right? What's the right way to do it? And Jesus tells her something he hadn't even probably told his disciples yet. This whole passage of scripture we get about God being wanting to, uh, to us to worship it in the spirit and truth, it comes in this conversation with this woman. And so he says, it's not about all that. It's going to be about what's going on inside of you. And in this conversation, you see Jesus has moved her from the whole conversation about water now worship, and he points her to the Father. And y'all know how I feel about the Father. It's all him. You see her even here. Here's the thing. She's a Samaritan. She's never referred to God as Father. That's a foreign concept. 
He says it's the Father, the Father, the Father, the Father. And so this is what happens. Watch what happens, right? Because he, he said, you can go get your husband. She goes, no, I'm not moving because you're, you're intriguing, right? And something's happening here, right? Now, you're, I perceive you're a prophet of God, right? So this is what she goes. This is what she says next. The woman says to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Right? She, she's picking up on this. This is a God moment. So now, instead of Jesus being the one dropping the breadcrumbs and seeing her pick him up, she throws one out there. Uh, I heard there's a Messiah coming. His name is Christ. When he comes, he's going to tell us a bunch of stuff. <laughs> and what did Jesus do? You got me. You got me. <laughs> you got it. You know, tell me what she's won, Johnny. You've just won a fabulous trip to the Bahamas. You know, she, 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 she got it. She got it. The discovery. And she gets it. And so the disciples have come back from, from, uh, from Chick-fil-A, and they, they, they've brought food. They brought, because you know that was there, you know. They, they brought food to Jesus, and they see Jesus talking with this woman. They're like, this is weird. Like, Peter, don't say anything. This is not the time, bro. Not the time. Let's just watch. And so this is what happens. Not only does, does this woman see uh, that Jesus is talking to her, obviously, but when she sees the other Jewish men come and see him talking with her, and they don't say anything, that also speaks to his authority. Because culturally, they should have checked them. But when they arrive on the scene and go, <laughs> it speaks to her. At that moment, she drops her water pot. She runs back to the city. She runs back to the city, and this is what she says. Verse 29, come see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? They went out of the town and were coming to him. Okay, side note, if she's a prostitute, if she's just promiscuous, what city gets excited when she says, hey, I met a new man. <laughs> He's out at the well. <laughs> right? What city's going to go, ooh, we got to meet him. No, it's not. Oh, come see this guy who told me everything I've ever done. Girl, we all know everything you've ever done. <laughs> see, that doesn't fit. It doesn't fit. On the other hand, when they see a woman who always is bowed over, who's always sad, who's always broken, who's always depressed, and she comes back to the city and her face is lit up saying, come see this man who told me everything I've ever done. And what she was saying is he knows me and he loves me and he accepts me. He's not normal. Could he be the Messiah? And then the people are like, he just might be. Honey, grab the kids. We got to go check this guy out. So they go out to the well. And as they're going out to the well, as they're going out to the well, now Jesus has some time to talk with the disciples. And the disciples are like, hey, Jesus. Um, yeah, so what, what was, was that all about, right, Jesus? He goes, he goes this, this is the context where he says, he says, look up. The fields are white with harvest. What you tell him to look up and see? The people coming out of Samaria coming to see him. They're ready. They're hungry. They heard her story. They said, I want some. Look up. That's what he says, look up. The people are coming, look up. That's it right there. That's why he had to go through Samaria, right there. Look up. And then they come. And they said, wow, now we believe in who you are, not just because of her testimony, but we've heard you ourselves. Can you stay with us two more days? You see, again, side note, he wasn't in a hurry to go through Samaria. I mean, to get to, it, it wasn't about geography. We had to go for a shortcut. No, because he stayed two more days in Samaria. And the Bible says many more Samaritans believed. God wanted to start a revival in Samaria. He said, let me talk to the one who's been widowed five times. Let me talk to the grieving one because I'm going to tell you, when, when her life gets changed, the whole city is going to know. The whole city is going to know only I could have put the smile back on her face. The whole city is going to know only I could have took her, bent over back, and made her straight up again. The only, only I could have been the one to put hope back in her soul. I'm going to start a revival in Samaria, and I have a meeting at the well. He needed to go through Samaria. He needed to go through Samaria. So let me tell you this. 
When you want to be a part of the move of God, the will of God, you've got to hear the voice of God. You've got to hear the voice of God. And it doesn't always come in some thundering, lightning, and, and, and burning bush and all that. Sometimes it comes in a little nudge. Sometimes it comes in that divine impulse. You just feel like something. It might be a conviction. And so that's what, chapter, what verse 4 is about. When he says he had to go through Samaria. It wasn't about geography. It was about purpose. There was a divine appointment. So he could have done everything the, the same route he, he normally went, but he did didn't go that right. He said, today, there's, there's a pull right here. Today, there's a I need to go through here. And you've had that experience, too, where you're on your way home. You just felt the need to pull over somewhere or stop at the bank or stop at the grocery store. Or you're in line. You feel the need to pay for the person in front of you. You're like, man, I, got, I need somebody to pay for my stuff. But like, how are you? God, you want to put that need in them to pay for my stuff. You know, you, 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 you need to. There's a need there. There's a need. I feel like I need to do it. It's not rational. It's not reasonable. But there's that feeling, that tug on your spirit. I feel like I need to give you this. I need to say this. I need to go here. And God sent me here to tell you to heed the need and follow his lead. That's all I came to say. Heed the need and follow his lead. Because the Father wants to reveal himself. There are people, and, and where are the wells in Roseville? The wells might be in your garage. The wells might be in your neighborhood, at your work. There's some place where God's going to position you. It's out of your way, but you feel the need to go here today. You feel the need to go there right now. It's out of your way, but God's setting you up for a divine encounter and a divine appointment where he wants to reveal his love to somebody who's broken and disgusted and, and depressed and angry or prideful or whatever. He wants to move through you. Heed the need and follow his lead. Because whenever you feel the need, it's because he wants to fill a need. Whenever you feel the need to do something, the compulsion to do it, he wants to fill a need. Heed the need and follow his lead. And it will lead you to God encounters every single time. God bless you. Uh, let's, uh, let's get some tri-tip.